Welcome to Crypto Clarified, Investing in the Truth, a podcast series where we come together each month to discuss the most captivating headlines and trends from the investing in crypto space. My name's Benjamin Dean, Director of Wisdom Tree's Digital Assets Team. You're you, and I'm joined by my co-host, the ever-brilliant Camilla Russo, founder of The Defiant, thedefiant.io. Cami, it's still August. Uh, have you had a time off uh, some break or some rest? <laughs> Um, I was supposed to take some time off uh, and went to this kind of spa in the middle of like the Arizona desert. It was beautiful, but couldn't really actually take time off and, <laughs> and ruin the holiday. Right. Um, so I- I'll have to try some at some other time. <laughs> right. It's, uh... Stop being a, a founder and, and take a vacation. And the problem is crypto doesn't take August off either. I'm in yeah, France no. right now where everyone takes the entire of August off. So I just watch people around enjoying their holidays while we oh, sit around. That's painful. At least clarifying crypto is interesting and fun. Yes. So it's not too hard. But yeah, unfortunately, crypto never takes a break, huh? Hey, we've also got uh, the one and only Jason Guthrie here today, the head of digital assets product at Wisdom Tree. Jason, have you had any success with holidays? Uh, about the same experience as Cammy. Tried to take a week <laughs> and uh, maybe got half of it. Oh, well. The good news for you today, though, is that we are clarifying crypto once again today, and there has been a lot of activity the last few weeks. We're going to kick off the show with talking about OFAC sanctions and the consequences for DeFi. We're going to do an update on the merge, and then if we have time at the end, we're going to bust some myths, because we love busting myths almost as much as we love clarifying crypto. But before we start the session, I have to do the usual shout out to James and Sam in compliance to state the following and to clarify. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of Wisdom Tree and the Defiant Media and are subject to change. Anything we present in this podcast is not intended to be relied upon as a forecast, research, nor as investment or tax advice. The information and opinions expressed in this podcast are not a recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any securities. Reliance upon them is at the sole discretion of the listener. Please remember, past performance is no indication of future results. All right, that's the end of the housekeeping. Now into the fun stuff. Uh, Fun stuff, OFAC. Uh, There's been a lot of activity the last few weeks uh, with with OFAC. Uh, There's been some sanctions imposed upon certain software. And then we're kind of watching the fallout, the implications for DeFi. To kick off the show today, we're going to go in depth on that. And... uh, For those of you who are listening who don't spend time in like the minutiae of US uh, four and three letter agencies and their roles and responsibilities, we have Jason here today as part of Wisdom Tree Prime has to think a lot about this. Jason, can you give the listeners a quick overview about what OFAC is and what role they have in enforcing sanctions in the United States of America? OFAC's the... uh... Look, the OFAC list for financial transactions really dictates uh, entities or individuals that financial institutions shouldn't do business with, right? It's very heavily focused on uh, money laundering, terrorism, finance, financial crime, um, and really just sort of serves as a essentially like a no-go list for anyone that wants to operate inside regulated financial services. Every regulated financial services firm has an obligation to ensure that they're not doing business with anyone that's included in the OFAC list. So it's something that every AML financial crime officer at, at every firm uh, takes very seriously and something that, you know, I've heard more than I would have liked to uh, about over the years, but it's it's something that people need to take very, very seriously. So having things go on an OFAC list is a big deal. Now, in the past, we've seen OFAC sanctioned Bitcoin addresses associated with Iranian hackers and, and North Korean hackers. Something new has happened in the last month, though, and Cami. Uh, It relates to Ethereum, and uh, it has implications on DeFi. What has happened, and uh, what are some of the early implications, you think, of what's been going on? Yeah. So what happened, uh, which was pretty unprecedented, was that the uh, U.S. Treasury Department sanctioned an entire protocol, Tornado Cash, uh, which is a mixer that's uh, meant to uh, ensure privacy when you're transacting on Ethereum. Um, and they've added Tornado Cash to uh, this OFAC list, which means that uh, no US person can transact uh, with you know anything kind of linked to Tornado Cash. 
And it's unprecedented because, as you said, usually it's individuals or entities that are sanctioned. Uh, like, you know, we, we've, we saw with uh, the, the war in Ukraine, how Russian oligarchs were sanctioned. Um, and yeah, sometimes individual uh, blockchain addresses are sanctioned. But in this case, it's really a smart contract. Uh, so Tornado Cash is a decentralized service. There's no company behind it. Um, there's no traditional hierarchical team uh, behind it. It's code running on Ethereum. And that's been put on this list. And so what that meant in practice is that all of the addresses that have ever interacted with Tornado Cash uh, are also on this list. Um, and it also means that people who had money on Tornado Cash uh, can't touch it anymore. Uh, and, you know, they their money is basically trapped there until they can get a special kind of permit uh, to, to withdraw it. Um, so, you know, there's many questions that are uh, coming out of this. Um, implications about uh, the right to privacy, implications about free speech, because there is legal precedence that says that code is regarded as speech. So if you're sanctioning code, are you infringing, you know, uh, speech? Um, the reason why uh, the U.S. Treasury uh, went against Tornado Cash is because it was being used by um, the Lazarus Group that's linked to uh, North Korean hackers. Uh, and uh, apparently the Lazarus Group, which was behind the, uh, the Ronin hack um, and other hacks on Ethereum, they were using Tornado Cash to kind of launder funds um, and in effect kind of help finance the North Korean uh, regime. So that's the reason behind it. Um, but I mean, my personal opinion is uh, go after the Lazarus Group. Don't go after Tornado Cash. Um, it's to me, it's it's pretty kind of outrageous that you're going after um, a neutral service uh, to go uh, to to try to stop someone uh, someone else's criminal activity. It's like going after uh, an email provider instead of going after the scammers doing phishing on that email provider. Um, you know, it would be after kind of going. It would be like going after a, a, a gun maker instead of going after the, you know, the person who, you know, used the gun for committing a crime and so on. Um, so it really doesn't make a, a lot of sense. Um, and what it's done is it's had like already huge ramifications all over DeFi because now there's been uh, this reaction from DeFi protocol front ends should be clarified, uh, where, for example, uh, Unisub's front end has restricted Tornado Cash addresses from interacting with uh, with Unisub, with the decentralized exchange. Uh, DYDX uh, did the same thing, Aave. So some of the biggest uh, DeFi projects have had to react to this because, as Jason said, um, it's a serious deal to be breaking kind of OFAC sanctions. So the teams behind these uh, DeFi projects who are running, uh, they, again, the interface, so not the actual smart contracts. Anyone can just still go and interact with like on chain. But if you want to use kind of the interface, like uniswap.org website, um, then, it, then you can't if, if you are kind of one of these sanctioned addresses. Um, and it's just, it's a shame. It like goes against everything that DeFi is supposed to stand for. So there's tons to unpack there, indeed. All of that is correct. You've got the dual use technology problem. Technologies can be used for different purposes uh, and uh, some might deem them good or bad. Uh, and what do you go after? Do you go after the, the, the manufacturer, the designer, 
the user, very different things. You touched on for the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Zimmerman proved in the 90s that software is text, speech. Uh, this was in the context of public key cryptography, uh, but going and sanctioning software, hmm, not sure how well that's gonna stand up. Uh, I know with our friends at the Coin Center are now thinking about bringing action against OFAC for, for overreach, not for First Amendment infringement, but that certainly is raised as well. And the last one there, uh, and Jason, I'll get some of your thoughts here. Th there's a term being thrown around called a dust attack. Uh, so for listeners th that don't follow this stuff as closely, um, can you mention that when you're put on the OFAC sanctions list, you're not allowed to send or receive uh, based on the address or the bank account uh, with these uh, sanctioned individuals. Now, of course, the thing is with these uh, digital asset networks, crypto networks, you can send, in inverted commas, crypto to people without them asking for it. And so what some folks did was go out there and start sending very small amounts of ether to the sanctioned wallets, uh, which technically puts all of the entities in uh, infringement of the OFAC sanctions. I think it's an excellent example of how laws become outdated as new technology comes along and changes. Uh, we see every once in a while laws need to be updated to deal with the realities of new technology. We saw it, for instance, with Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which was a safe harbor for s social media companies. To your point, Cammy. Uh, what, the social media companies were given immunity from what activity and things people said on their networks. And that's, that was kind of one of the cornerstones that allowed that industry to grow. Jason, thinking a little bit about this kind of, are laws and regulations kind of in line with the realities of technology, looking at how OFAC sanctions are being implemented, thinking about things like these dust attacks. Do you have any thoughts there about like where the salient issues lie or where like some changes might be needed to bring this up to speed? I think regulation is almost always a lagger, right? They, they don't get ahead of the innovation. They don't sort of lay the groundwork for it, but rather they respond to it. And that's always been the case. We can't expect a big governmental agency who's responsible for, you know, oversight of, of the various money movements within the economy to, to also have a, a view toward what the innovation is. I think where you get a bigger problem is when the gap between sort of where they are, where their understanding is on a given technology and the reality of it gets too wide. And I think we're at a point at the moment where that gap is is too wide. Um, this isn't like, you know, a, a new structured product coming out or the, the difference between, say, mutual funds and ETFs that they need to regulate for. There is a big gap between the way things work in financial markets today and the way things would work in a more decentralized, blockchain-native, smart uh, contract empowered world and you know no one is out there saying that these organizations these government entities shouldn't be uh, trying to limit financial crime that they shouldn't be trying to stop you know the Lazarus group from stealing crypto and profiting from it right absolutely we should be doing that and it feels like they're reaching for the tools at their disposal and those tools that that are at their disposal aren't really appropriate it's super unlikely that the Lazarus group actually has any cash left in tornado cash and someone else is just going to spin up another version of the open source software so what have they done other than you know impede innocent people that happen to be using the service and so you know you can give them the benefit of the doubt and saying they're trying to do the best of the tools that they've got but it, it does seem like the gap is too big and the tools that they've got aren't fit for purpose so let's go a bit deeper on that topic because Cammy just raised it as well. You just said like someone can just spin up their own version of the software. And Cammy mentioned before as well, on a lot of these DeFi applications, on the front end of them, there have these OFAC sanctions have been implemented by a company called TRM Labs. Mm -hmm. They do compliance through an API on the front end. Cammy, uh, let's just think a little bit closely about that. The difference between the front end software and the protocol level uh, and then like people's ability to just spin up their own addresses or fork the software and run it themselves. Is that, in a way that is DeFi, right? That's the permis permissionless nature of it. On the other hand, like these front ends uh, allow for censorship basically of transactions and participation, which is not DeFi, at least uh, yeah. in my understanding of how you think about it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I guess to just uh, clarify what, you know, how this works, in on on you know public blockchains like ethereum uh, developers can uh, 
run a different kind of sets of, of code on the blockchain itself. And because uh, the way that the blockchain works is uh, in this decentralized kind of uh, permissionless uh, way, when you're running a smart contract on, on Ethereum, anyone can access it. Uh, there's nobody to do KYC on an Ethereum smart contract. It's running in a decentralized way. Um, and you know, as long as the code works, it can keep executing and running forever. So you know, once Uniswap uh, kind of uh, uploads their their code to Ethereum, um, that's it. Uh, there's you know, it's immutable. You can't go and change it. It'll run and it'll be there. Um, that's why you know, whenever. Uh, still with the Uniswap example, whenever Uniswap needs to upgrade, it, it has to launch a whole kind of new set of smart contracts on Ethereum and do like a V2 trend, like a uh, transition. Uh, and it's, it's not just about like going in and changing the code, uh, because you know, the V1 is still there and it's just running forever. Um, so that means that uh, there's nobody to stop you. Uh, from stopping any individual person anywhere in the world from accessing that piece of code. Um, the difference is that, that you have to be pretty technical to access that piece of code directly without a kind of user facing interface that uh, gives you access to that code. But in theory, you know, you could, you could just like, swap tokens with the Ethereum, with the, sorry, with the Uniswap smart contract um, directly without using the uh, Uniswap interface. Um, but to make these, uh, these pieces of code accessible to the everyday user, uh, Uniswap kind of labs, like the company be behind development of Uniswap uh, creates these, this website essentially and made to access their, their code. So that's what can be um, censored because there's a centralized company that's developing this website that is running on a centralized server. Um, and, and so, you know, of course, Uniswap Labs, Hayden, you know, the Uniswap founder, they don't wanna go to jail for breaking uh, OFAC sanctions. And I don't think anyone in DeFi wants him to go to, go to jail for this. So, so that's kind of where, where they're at. Uh, all these DeFi projects, even though I am sure they, they hate it, they need to comply with this uh, because they have these, they're, they, they are kind of centralized organizations behind these front ends. Um, some DeFi projects are fully decentralized, so they're DAOs and maybe they have more leeway in, you know, in not listening uh, to to these sanctions, but um, so that's kind of uh, where this censorship comes from, from the front end of these DeFi projects, and not on the smart contracts themselves, which keep running, um, and then, and are censorship resistant. So what's become, I think, an important lesson for for DeFi from from all of this is that. DeFi needs decentralized front ends as well. Um, and I'm surprised at kind of the little development that we've seen on this uh, in the past kind of months and years, uh, because it's not this, the first time that something like this happens. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's been clear that this is a central point of failure uh, for, for DeFi. And there are ways to create uh, more decentralized and censorship resistant uh, front ends. Um, so I think this is, this, this will be an interesting thing to watch. Like I, I think uh, we'll see more effort towards producing decentralized interfaces to interact with, uh, with DeFi protocols. I'm sure it's a topic we're going to come back to in future months. I mean, the developer Lexi Pertsev has been arrested in the Netherlands mm -hmm. on suspicion of having committed an offense. Um, the Dutch Fiscal Information and Investigation Service has made a public statement, this developer of Tornado Cash. The development of a tool is not prohibited, but if a tool has been created for the purpose 
of committing criminal acts, then it may be punishable. So there's no First Amendment in the Netherlands, and uh, Alexei is uh, not going to have a fun time there. We're going to have to see how it plays out. That's all the time we've got to talk about OFAC sanctions and DeFi. We will return in future months, I'm sure. The reason we've got to move on is because there's another very big event about to occur. We've talked about it in previous shows. Um, so this is going to be an update, an update on the Ethereum merge, which is scheduled to happen over the next two to three weeks, um, assuming everything goes smoothly. Um, by the time we speak next, it should be complete. Akami, could you just quickly re remind everyone, just in a few sentences, what the merge is, uh, what point we're at now, and what's about to happen? Yeah. Um, so like we've said before, uh, the merge is probably the biggest development that, uh, that's kind of bound to happen on Ethereum's history. Um, it's the transition to proof of stake uh, from proof of work. Uh, and these are two types of consensus algorithms or, you know, the way that the blockchain uh, has to uh, validate and confirm transactions. So proof of work, the same consensus algorithm as Bitcoin, uh, what it does is it has uh, nodes or, or participants in this network uh, put power or energy uh, towards securing the network. And the more power you, you put in, the more likely you are to uh, confirm a transaction and therefore get um, uh, Bitcoin or uh, Ether fees. Um, now, proof of stake, uh, what it does is instead of requiring nodes, in the case of proof of stake, they're called validators, to, um, to put kind of energy and power uh, towards securing the network, what they do is they provide stake or they provide capital to secure the network. So that means that, you know, in the case of Ethereum, validators need to deposit at least uh, 32 ETH uh, or uh, or kind of m multiples of, uh, of 32 to um, to secure the network and the, the more you have at stake in on the Ethereum network, the more likely it is that you're able to confirm transactions and get um, uh, fees uh, as, as a reward. So that's a big difference. Uh, of course, this means that uh, Ethereum is about to become a lot less energy intensive than the current chain, a lot less energy intensive than, than Bitcoin, which should ease um, uh, some of the concerns about, uh, you know, uh, environmental uh, concerns um, about blockchains. Um, and uh, another kind of effect that this is supposed to have is on increasing decentralization in theory, because, you know, validators aren't required to put up all this infrastructure that's linked to a uh, proof of work, which is, you know, these big kind of mining rigs and um, and kind of mining farms uh, that that come up uh, to secure the Ethereum and, and Bitcoin network. On in the case of, of Ethereum, now all you need is um, it's just capital. You know, it's just the the stake, the the ETH uh, to deposit. So it should make uh, becoming an Ethereum validator accessible to a larger. Uh, group of uh, people, hopefully, you know, making Ethereum more decentralized. What it doesn't do, and this is important to clarify, is it doesn't improve scalability significantly. Um, so, you know, that this has been kind of Ethereum's Achilles heel, um, the, the lack of scalability, how expensive it gets, how slow it gets when there's a lot of usage. Uh, proof of stake does not uh, improve this. Um, this kind of uh, improvement in scalability comes further down the Ethereum roadmap, but it doesn't come uh, with the merge. And then one last thing that's supposed to happen is um, with the merge, you know, some kind of aspects of, of, uh, of um, uh, Ethereum rewards and fees change so that uh, inflation uh, comes down, the inflation rate of Ethereum comes down. Um, and that paired with the fact that ETH is burnt with Ethereum activity, 
um, has some kind of Ethereum uh, investors hoping that uh, ETH may become a deflationary asset so that supply will kind of decrease over time. That's still kind of to be proven, uh, but that's kind of the, the theory that some like that might happen after the merge. So Jason, for the institutional investor segment of the audience, they're probably sitting here thinking, you know, proof of work, proof of stake, it's the inflation schedule, it's all a bit confusing. What would like be the two or three things that you think they need to be passing out of all this? Uh, because I keep seeing press writing articles about it. Uh, so I understand there's a lot of information out there. Uh, if there were two or three things that institutional investors should ask themselves or be considering the next couple of weeks, what, what would you think they could be? So I, I think the ESG point is a relevant one for institutions. Like I, I personally am on the record, you know, that I don't really buy into the arguments against, you know, Bitcoin or crypto on on this ESG grounds, but you know, carbon emissions is a real thing and people with the ESG screens, and this is a substantially easier consensus mechanism to get through the various compliance hoops and onboarding, et cetera, that institutions need to go through. So this is a real point that I think will enable a large, well-established chain to be a gateway for a lot of institutions. So that's, it's, it's definitely a valid point or a relevant point for, uh, for institutions. I think the other thing that I've heard a lot of people, um, kind of latching onto is this idea of the Ethereum ecosystem uh, incrementally improving itself, right? Again, you can argue around whether it is an improvement, whether it's going to be more or less decentralized, the inflation schedule, whatever. But I think when you see incremental changes to attempt to facilitate like future states, that helps a lot of people get comfortable or more comfortable with it as well. I think one of the biggest pushbacks that you see from uh, a lot of sort of established investors is won't this technology just get supplanted by someone coming along and improving on X, Y, or Z uh, metric. And so the fact that this is evolving and changing um, to suit a future state, right, uh, is has I think been compelling to a lot of people. Again, it's yet to be seen whether or not that's going to play out in a, in a positive way for a lot of these changes. But I do think the fact that it is is is, is a meaningful point for people. Indeed. Well, we're going to see in the next few weeks how this plays out. I personally, as a cybersecurity person, am interested to see if kind of the transition in production works and then the impact on applications built on Ethereum, if there are any kind of hiccups there. But it's definitely one step along what is a very long roadmap in the evolution of Ethereum. And uh, yeah, it's definitely going to catch a lot of mind space for the next month. We're coming up on time. Uh, we've only got a little bit of time for a Mythbuster, but this one's an easy one, given our discussion today. Uh, I read sometimes people say that crypto is anonymous. Uh, I think that they mean pseudonymous. But uh, do either of you have any quick 30-second snapshots on uh, this claim that crypto is... No one knows who's using crypto. It's, it's all invisible people and criminals. I, I, I think that one's been busted a while ago, right? Like, go and yeah. Google Bitcoin seized. And you'll find any number of examples of authorities actually going and seizing Bitcoin from people doing criminal activity. Um, the fact that something like Tornado Cash, a mixer designed to anonymize it, exists kind of proves that it's not anonymous, right? The fact that everything is public and immutable and there forever actually makes it kind of very traceable. I mean, you've got to connect it with individuals, but it is there, it's visible. People are putting the dots together and have been for a while. Cammy, any last thoughts? I mean, I, yeah, I think it's it's pretty clear. Um, it's a fact that uh, public blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum are pseudonymous. You're using an address that can be traced back to you uh, as a person. Um, even when you know using Tornado Cash, uh, uh, like regulators, law enforcement has been able to trace those uh, users. So. You know, um, I think it's it's pretty clear, um, and I think um, law enforcement uh, actually likes uh, criminals using blockchain for this reason. It is extremely traceable, and it's there forever. Yeah, absolutely. Well, with that, we're out of time. I hope everyone found today's podcast useful and informative. As a reminder, if you want us to cover any topics in the future, if you want more information, you can use the old school email, crypto clarified at wisdom dot com. You can find Cami at Cami Russo on Twitter, Jason at Guthrie Fi, and me, Benjamin Dean, on Twitter. 
please reach out. We always love questions. Any way we can clarify crypto more, we are happy to do so. Thank you very much for listening and we hope you have all a good day. Ciao.